My name's Dylan, and I will be your lecture captain tonight. Hello. Uh, welcome, everybody, to Caltech. Today, I just have a few logistical notes to go through. Um, so it turns out that for the first time in three years, we've been clouded out of observing tonight. So if you're excited to go out and see the moon and Mars and Jupiter, I'm sorry about that. Although, uh, Cameron Hummels will be out in the lobby with one of our outreach telescopes. And if you're interested in just learning how a telescope works, you can pop right out there after the talk is done, and they'll show you the ropes. Um, so that's logistical note number one. Uh, we're going to have, as usual, a 30-minute talk uh, by Professor Bethany Elman, um, who is a professor of planetary science here at Caltech and also a research scientist at JPL. And um, it's going to be 30 minutes. And then we're going to have five minutes of questions for Professor Elman. And then we're going to have a short intermission uh, where we'll be bringing in a table. And we'll have four volunteers who are scientists at Caltech working in various different fields who will be able to answer any questions about astronomy that you have or you know, just think up on the spot. Um, and simultaneously with the panel, Cameron's going to be out there uh, with the telescope demonstrating how it works. Uh, a few more things. Um, this is a monthly event, the Stargazing and Lecture Series. Uh, currently on the docket, we have uh, Eve Lee, who will be giving a talk about planets big and small and Phil Hopkins, who's going to be talking about making galaxies on a supercomputer. So both really cool topics. Uh, come back next month and come back the month afterwards. Hope to see you here again. Uh, and uh, we're, we also have a second event, um, which happens uh, roughly once a month as well, called Astronomy on Tap, which happens at a local bar called Der Wolfskopf in Old Town. And, uh, yeah, we have a bunch of talks coming up. I think the next one is November 5th. Um, that one, unfortunately, is uh, ages 21 and up. But the Stargazing and Lecture Series is open to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let's see. Oh, also, uh, Carnegie Observatories, which is the organization that runs the telescope up on Mount Wilson, uh, is going to have their annual open house this Sunday. So the Sunday afternoon, so feel free to drop by. Uh, there's some flyers outside. There also, there's also the outreach schedule outside if you haven't taken one. Uh, and Carnegie is going to have a planetarium. It's going to be all sorts of uh, professional astronomers to talk to. Uh, and they'll be sharing the work that they've been doing. Um, and I think that's all the logistical notes today. Uh, so let's welcome Professor Elman. <laughs> and... I uh, hear about series. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks for that. I appreciate it, Dylan, and I appreciate the invitation to be here. I guess you can hear me okay on the wireless mic if it will stay attached. First step. Okay, um, so this is actually going to be my first public talk on series, so I'm excited to see how it goes. I, I am a planetary scientist, but who came to planetary science via geology. So I'm a professor in geological and planetary sciences here, and I've spent most of my career so far working on Mars. But being at Caltech, being at JPL, has been an opportunity to expand outward into the solar system and get involved in all kinds of exciting missions of exploration. And I've had the honor for the last few years of working with the, the Dawn science team, and we just tested this and now it's not working, on the Dawn science team um, on the uh, mission that is right now orbiting Ceres, which is a dwarf planet, and as I'll tell you, it's had some unexpected surprises. So Ceres, probably not everyone in this room thinks about Ceres every day, so where is it? So the Earth is one AU away from the sun, and Ceres is 2.7 times further out. It's in the asteroid belt. It is the largest asteroid. And in fact, it has 30% of the mass of the entire asteroid belt. So it's a big object. How does Ceres compare to some other objects in the solar system that you might be familiar with? So here's Ceres over to the side here. It's about... Um, uh, about a thousand kilometers in diameter, and you can see some of the objects in the in the Kuiper Belt, including 
former planets, uh, shown for scale. So you can get the sense that Ceres is pretty large. It's, it's also a dwarf planet. It's, it's, it's circular, but it has not cleared out its orbit. It's, it's in the asteroid belt. Uh, for those of you who like to think about the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, it's about four times larger than Enceladus, that beautiful moon spewing out jets of water from its south pole, and two times smaller than Europa. Okay, So that helps place it. Now, Asteroids are really interesting to planetary scientists and planetary geologists because they, they hold all of the fingerprints of the formation of the solar system, the early first few million years of solar system history, when we think that there was a nebula of gas and solids. So what was happening at this time? You, you may have seen lectures by some of my colleagues, Constantine Batygin, talking about the massive collisions that happened at this part in the solar, of the solar system history. As small clumps of dust became larger and larger, they collided. They eventually formed planets. But back in the day that there was just a protoplanetary disk with some rocky material, some uh, water vapor, carbon dioxide, and such. There was a uh, somewhere, um, somewhere between around twi 2 AU, people argue maybe at Earth distance 1 AU, maybe at Ceres distance around 3 AU, there was a frost line. So inside of the frost line, water was vapor. Most materials didn't retain water. Outside, ice was, was stable, um, and water was retained by all kinds of bodies. So, so this was the, what was happening in the early solar system as these bodies were accreted. Some of them accreted with ice, some of them did not. The other thing that was happening is that there was this um, radioactive nuclide that existed during the first um, 100,000 years or so of solar system history that does not exist today because it exhausted itself. That is aluminum-26. And if you think about it, aluminum is a pretty... Um, common element, and there was enough of it that it was heating, the, that the heat from the radioactive decay was heating these uh, rocky and icy bodies as they came together. Now, how do we know all of this? Why do we think we know all of this? Well, part of it is spacecraft missions to asteroids, but the other is that we have the pieces of these asteroids that recorded these processes, and we have them in meteorites. We have them in meteorites you can go down and see at the Museum of Natural History. So the meteorites fall into different families. Some are called carbonaceous chondrites all the way to metallic ones. Um, but what I think the key takeaway is that some of them that formed when there was uh, ice and water in contact and that aluminum-26 heated them up, some of them then had hydrous minerals. That was the fingerprint of the fact that there was water, that there was rock, that they, heat, that they came together quickly enough, and then they heated and to form these minerals that sequestered the water. Others were rocky and dry. There was no water around when they formed, or they lost all their water. And then some were metal, in fact, or maybe the cores of these rocky asteroids. So we might expect then, if we took this cloud and we took the bodies that were forming from it, a rather orderly progression between metal-rich, rockier, maybe some hydrous minerals where there used to be water, but the water melted and reacted, maybe just icy bodies out here. So you might expect some sort of organization. Now, we'll show you a complicated plot, though, that suggests what really happened in the solar system. This is a schematic where rocky uh, planets, as I just said, orderly, rocky, hydrous, then icy. But what we think has happened is a number of dynamical events throughout solar system history. Jupiter moving in a little. Several hundred million years later, Uranus and Neptune swapping places. So this originally orderly progression of bodies in the solar system, as you can see, it's being sorted and being mixed and mixed and mixed and mixed by all of these progressive events until what we're left with today, there's still, we think, more icy material in the outer solar system. But we expect that today in the inner solar system, the main belt has a, this, this mixture of all of these different types of materials, some of which were collected in from the outer solar system and some of which formed where they were. So it's in this context that Ceres is particularly interesting because we, we knew some things prior to sending a spacecraft there. We knew that Ceres uh, was not very dense. Uh, the density of a rock is about three, 
Ceres was a lot less dense, so that meant Ceres had ice in it. We knew that. We knew that Ceres kind of looked like these hydrous meteorites with the minerals with water, but I didn't want to get into the details. I skipped the slides. Ceres had some strange infrared spectral features that signified that it was different from the other hydrous rocky asteroids. Probably icy, but with, with some different kinds of absorption features going on. So, so we knew, and it was debated, what it was due to. There's, there's a long list here. Early in its history, we predicted that because Ceres was large, that because it had water and rock and it created early, that maybe at one point in its history it even had an ocean of water underneath its surface, maybe. And we certainly predicted that there might be ice near the surface. So to this largest asteroid in the solar system, uh, the Dawn mission launched in 2007 to look at two of the largest asteroids, Vesta, a rocky body, and Ceres, this, this mysterious icy body. There were three instruments on board, a framing camera, a uh, gamma-ray neutron detector for chemistry, a visible near-infrared spectrometer for mineralogy and ices. And this was very, a very international mission. You can see from the logos here. It's a NASA mission, but with Italy and Germany contributing some very important instruments to the cause. So onward, launched, and the mission first uh, spiraled out from the sun first had a phase of investigation of Vesta, and I will not be talking about it in, that, in, in this talk. Hopefully, a, a few years ago, you had a, a, some sort of discussion of, of, of Vesta. It's, a, it's an amazing rocky body, the second largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. But after a successful mission at Vesta, the, the Dawn spacecraft continued to spiral outward until arriving at Ceres in the spring of, of 2015, and it's been mapping there ever since. So Ceres, as you got closer and closer and closer, it became more of a world where you could start to resolve landforms, resolve craters. And this is the, the view, the first full global view of Ceres uh, spinning uh, around. So Ceres is actually quite dark. Um, this this uh, black and white image has been enhanced for contrast. Ceres is nearly as, is about as black as the screen that you're actually looking at. Only about um, 7 to 9% of the sunlight incident upon it is reflected back. So it's mostly a dark place, but you can see there are some intriguing features pockmarking its cratered surface. So there are a number of major findings at Ceres, and I'm going to talk about those that are related to its composition, because I think those are the most exciting. So let's, let's talk about what all of these words that geologists and mineralogy nerds like myself uh, like to talk about. Carbonates, phyllosilicates, carbonaceous chondrites. Okay, what does this all mean? Okay, so... I, I'm going to go, go nerdy for a second here and say that this is the, the spectrum of Ceres, okay? So it, in, in this particular viewing geometry, you're getting 4% of the light back to your detector, and it's not a flat line. It's not reflecting light back to you equally at all wavelengths. There are these absorptions that are the fingerprints of the chemicals that make up the surface of, of Ceres. We can see that there are some iron-bearing minerals in Ceres. There are some hydroxyl minerals. And if you think OH, you should also think H2O. Same materials. These are the fingerprints of hydrous minerals. Um, some carbonate minerals, like carbonate, like baking soda that you might have in your refrigerator. And then something weird, ammonia. If you think about walking around on the surface of Earth or even picking up any rocks, you don't normally think about ammonia being in those rocks. So this was an odd fingerprint uh, of Ceres. You might ask at this point, well, OK, so that Ceres is odd, but you, know, you, don't, you don't see meteorites every day. You don't see carbonaceous chondrite meteorites. Uh, is Ceres weird in comparison to the meteorites? And the answer is kind of yeah. Ceres is not exactly like the meteorites, these, even these most hydrous meteorites that we have in our collection either. So here's a carbonaceous chondrite, dark, full of um, hydrous minerals with OH and H2O uh, in them. Here's a, here's a nice close-up view of, of what some of those look like with mineral grains of, of iron-bearing olivine minerals, matrix of hydrated minerals. And here are their spectra. Ceres is the black line. Okay, so even if you're not a trained spectroscopist, you can see what's the same and what's different. 
I'll, I'll guide your eye here. So it has the hydrous minerals, just like the meteorites. It has carbonates, like that baking soda in your fridge, just like the meteorites. But ammonia continues to be weird. There's no ammonia in materials uh, in the meteorite collection. So that was our first hint that something was, was a bit odd about Ceres. OK, let's, let's talk about carbon, though. Uh, car carbonates and maybe organic carbon, like we, like we have in our bodies. The other instrument, other than our infrared spectrometer, was this, this grand instrument to measure elemental chemistry. Here I'm showing a plot of hydrogen, and here I'm showing carbon. OK? And here are some other materials. So green and blue, those are all the meteorites in our collection. Here's uh, dust from Halley's Comet that was collected. And here's Ceres. OK, so Ceres is somewhere in between the meteorites in our collection and a comet. What is a comet doing hanging out in the asteroid belt? Comets are usually from way further out in the solar system. So these, these were some of, the, some of the puzzles. Now, ammonia. Back to our, our strange ammonia. Ammonia is something that is not stable, typically, in the inner solar system. This is from my colleague, Mike Brown, famous Pluto killer, Mike Brown, who wants to figure out what the Kuiper Belt objects are made of. So that's what this blue zone is. He's trying to figure out where the Kuiper Belt objects, like Pluto, like Haumea, like, like Maki Mahi, came from. And what he's done is he's made a plot of like where ices are stable. And if you're to the right of this line, the ice is stable. If you're to the left of this line, the ice is going to be lost in the space. So Earth would be here. Earth would be at 1 on the plot. The asteroid belt is at H2O. So there's some H2O in the asteroid belt, water, ice. That makes sense. There is not ammonia in the asteroid belt. In fact, there's not ammonia anywhere near the asteroid belt. Neptune would plot here on the plot. So ammonia is somewhere around Neptune, hanging out in the solar system. But somehow, it got to Ceres. So this is, this is pretty neat. And this has been one of the most exciting findings of the, the Dawn mission, which is not is to ask this question, really. It seems like Ceres is a visitor from somewhere in the outer solar system, or at least the materials that we're measuring on Ceres are from the outer solar system. So maybe it formed outward, migrated in. Uh, maybe just a bunch of material came and scattered itself uh, on the surface of Ceres, but then why wouldn't it be on other asteroids? So what the Dawn team thinks is that Ceres grew somewhere out in the realm of the giant planets, and then during all of this reorganization of the solar system was scattered inward into the asteroid belt. That is it, is, it is a voyager, in a sense, from the outer asteroid belt going in with this ammonia fingerprint uh, being, being the tracer. So I'm going to go ahead and, and say, and whoops. One of the other things we were able to do is figure out, well, how much ice is in Ceres? So this is a map. I'm going to spend some time on it because it's a little bit hard to explain, but it's a, it's a cool map because uh, this is a map of hydrogen uh, made by the grand instrument in the uppermost half meter of the surface. So take that much and think about how much water is in the upper half meter. So if we were to take the, how much water is in the upper half meter of like this floor, I don't know, maybe it's 1%. It's something small, right? If we were to go out there and measure the, the soil, I, I just heard it was raining, so let, let's assume that it wasn't raining. I don't know. But, but it, if, if we were taking our normal dry California soil, it might be somewhere on the order of 10% or so. So even at the equator of Ceres, exposed to the vacuum of space, uh, Ceres has 16 weight percent water in its crust. And that, that's a ton of, of hydrated minerals. And as you go to the poles, as it becomes colder, uh, you start to get water ice just beneath the surface, stable against being lost to the vacuum of space. So we have up to 30% water. Is anyone a fan of The Expanse, the sci-fi series? What do they mine for water? 
Asteroids, and in fact, Ceres Station. They're hollowing out Ceres in the expanse. Okay, well, I'm not advocating that we hollow out Ceres and mine it for water, but I'm just saying, in this case, the sci-fi writers got it right uh, because we have, even in the uppermost half meter that's dry and desiccated from space, up to 16% water, and if you go to the poles, it's up to 30%. So not, not such a bad idea if you're 100 years and 150 years in the future and you need water on Mars, which is the premise of the expanse. Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zip ahead and just show you a picture of what Ceres looks like, uh, we think, on the inside. So we think that there's about 30% or so water ice in that upper shell, the uppermost portion of Ceres. And below that, it's just sort of a ball of highly water-altered rock. If you were to, to go up to this, this type of rock and scratch your finger on it, you'd probably be able to scratch your finger on it because that, the rock has been so infused with water. So it has a core of hydrosilicate in an icy shell. Okay, you may have noticed, but I didn't talk about it yet, the other fun thing about Ceres, which as it's rotating, so with its ammonia-covered dark surface, you should be asking, well, why aren't you talking about these bright spots? What are the spots? They're the clear anomaly uh, of, of Ceres. So I think the spots are one of the most exciting and, and indeed unexpected uh, findings of the Dawn mission, which is that they probably formed recently and they're very salt rich. So this implies that there were briny waters at some point relatively recently in Ceres history. Now, when you looked at these spots, or when the science team looked at these spots, the immediate first thought is, oh, okay, well, we think Ceres is icy, it has a dark shell, maybe they're just water ice, right? Like, like a crater or something hits Ceres, exposes some bright ice, then that ice is eventually lost to space. And that is the case in Oxo Crater, which is uh, this crater here. It's about 10 kilometers across or so, and you can see these very bright white walls. So this is one of the bright spots, and we know from our spectroscopic instrument that it has the fingerprints of water ice. Uh, it's at a slope that faces the poles, it's cold, and the water ice right there right now is presently surviving loss against the vacuum of space. But when we kept looking at bright spot after bright spot after bright spot, actually the vast majority of them are not water ice. So now I'm going to show you a few slides of what these bright spots look like up close and talk about what they are. And you'll see on some of my slides that there's this word facula that appears. You know, sometimes scientists like to come up with extra words, and this might be one of those cases, uh, because the, there is an official technical term for a bright spot. And so you'll see me use facula interchangeably uh, with, with, with bright spot. But let's, let's look at some of these, and let's look at them uh, up close. So this crater here is Helani Crater, and it's about 40 kilometers across, and it's beautiful, right? This false color infrared image acquired with Dawn's framing camera um, shows this, this very pristine impact crater, sharp walls, central peak. This means it formed pretty recently if it's so uh, pristine. And then this bright material very clearly being uh, either excavated or created by this crater because it's found throughout the materials ejected by this crater. Another spectacular example is what I had on my color slide, which is Ocator Crater, which is almost 100 kilometers across. It has um, a set of bright spots, including an amazing deposit uh, in its center, which if we zoom in and look at color, um, looks, like, looks like this. So this is a dome. Uh, it's about... Uh, 10 kilometers across or so, uh, this direction. Those of you who are sitting in the front of the room can see that there's this kind of yellowish material. It's heavily fractured. And something that's intriguing is there really aren't very many impact craters superimposed on top of it. You saw the rest of series pockmarked with impact craters. The fact that are, there are few, and the ones that are here are tiny, is important because that means that this has to be pretty young. It wasn't hit by an impact. And we think that this dome structure with these fractures is a kind of a cryovolcano. That is a volcano of ice or salt, or both. Okay, we're gonna go nerdy for one moment and talk spectra. Okay, 
because this is what I do and what I love. And you know, this is a case where I think it's pretty clear what's happening, actually. And, and, and it shows how we trace things using infrared spectra. So we're looking at the central portion of the crater, and we're going to go from the dark material, which is number one, which is dark over in these plots over here, to progressively brighter materials up till five, which is that bright blue. So as you do that, even if you're not a trained spectroscopist, you can see, well, first of all, uh, the dark floor is getting brighter. Well, that's good. It should. It's a bright spot. OK, so we're, we're getting brighter. But what's happening over here with these absorptions that are the fingerprints of the composition is that they're changing too. OK, so as we move into the bright spot, we go from nothing happening. It's just kind of flat to this very strong feature that's due to ammonium and salt or aluminum OH. As we go from the dark material here in black, to the, um, to the bright material in blue, we see more hydrous mineral, different kind of hydrous mineral coming in. We interestingly, we see our ammonia decreasing in strength and our carbonate really rocking and coming in here, coming in here again at another carbonate band and at a location that's specifically sodium carbonate. Sodium carbonate. Now, there are only a few places where we see sodium carbonate uh, and here are two of them. We see them in Lake Searles. Does anyone happen to be there? It's what, yeah, OK, a few people. Yeah, it's one of these salt lakes uh, in California. It's an alkaline soda lake, very uh, high pH waters. Think about like dumping your baking soda in water. You basically get sodium carbonates like this. The other place, interestingly, that we see sodium carbonate in large amounts in the solar system are the plumes that are coming out of Enceladus. So the icy ocean underneath Enceladus is also releasing sodium carbonate. OK, so th this makes series very interesting and very odd. If we map where these sodium carbonates are, they're patchily throughout the surface, usually uh, accompanied by these large impact craters. But there's one astonishing example that is not in an impact crater. This is the other largest deposit of sodium carbonate on Ceres, and it's in a mountain. Going across the surface of Ceres, all of a sudden, there's this four-kilometer uh, hill, flat-topped hill. What is it? Well, we're still scratching our heads about this a little bit. But the explanation that seems to make sense is that the salts are somewhat less dense uh, than the rest of the crust. And over time, any salts that formed and crystallized in the subsurface may have just simply risen through the surface to the top over time. It's something called diapirism. It happens in the Gulf of Mexico with salt domes coming up underneath the ocean. Maybe this is what's happening on Ceres to explain why there is this mountain of, of sodium carbonate salt. Now, this is not the only place crater floors and mountains, mountains, ahunamans, crater floors, ejecta, you've seen those. And they're tiny little bright spots pit marking the surface absolutely everywhere. I'm going to end this talk by um, talking about some work that we're doing at Caltech right here, right now, with Nathan Stein, who's actually in the audience. Want to wave? <laughs> you can ask him questions, too, because now I'm about to talk about his stuff. Uh, what Nathan and I have been working on, along with other members of the Dawn team, is trying to answer the question, how did the bright spots form, and how old are they? OK, so as I said, there are all these bright spots. Here I'm just showing them as dots, because this, this is a way of including the little ones that we otherwise couldn't see in this view. So they're really all over the surface in the area that we surveyed. We didn't, we didn't survey these areas in our study. So they're, they're all over. They're mostly associated with craters. But OK, let's see if we can, we can think about OK, so they're associated with craters. So what might be the hypothesis for how they've formed? Maybe because there's a lot of energy involved in craters, when there's a giant impact, there's enough heat that maybe the heat causes the materials to melt and, and the ice to melt and these salt, briny waters to form and rise to the surface. And that's what creates them. OK, if that's the case, we would expect the largest and deepest craters to have these salts and maybe to have more salts, OK? Right? We'd expect the large ones with more energy, more energy to heat to have these salts. Is this true? So here's what Nathan did, uh, plotted diameter uh, versus depth of the craters. We can see uh, all of the craters that were surveyed here in gray. 
And here are the ones with the bright spots. They're shown in blue. So do all of the largest, deepest craters have these bright spots? Well, no. There are some large ones that are pretty deep out here that don't. Some others scattered in here. But they do tend to be in the deeper craters and the larger craters. And in fact, if we look regionally, they are always in the largest and deepest craters in a particular region. So here the craters are being color-coded by, so the biggest ones are up here, and they're color-coded by the region. So in a local sense, they are the largest and the deepest. So what we think is that Ceres may have something of a lumpy interior. <laughs> well, or sometimes there's enough water ice and salts to create brines, and sometimes not. So there are kind of two ideas that we're, we're, we're kind of struggling with now, trying to decide between. So the first one is kind of what I said, that, that maybe these impacts into the, so imagine blue is ice rich, think volatile, think water ice. So the impact crater hits, it releases its heat into the subsurface, it heats an area, um, and then the brines pool at the surface of Ceres, and then evaporate sublime into space, leaving behind a salt deposit that's the bright spot that we see today. Makes sense. Another idea uh, is that perhaps Ceres has these pockets of brine or salts beneath the surface now, and maybe it, it's not clear that we have enough heat to make them, but maybe what happens is that because the surface becomes fractured, that the material then can upwell in cracks, similar to the way the dye appears may have created a Hunamans to the surface to make these salt deposits. So this is what we're thinking, and we're, and I, th I think this, either of these are a pretty good model, and either of these are pretty exciting because they mean that there were briny waters, salty waters on the surface, and pretty recently uh, on Ceres. Now, the other place that we see bright spots is on the rims of craters. Um, and uh, Nathan and I think that this helps us constrain how long ago um, these materials may have formed and may have been exposed. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump ahead to an idea and this is a thought, and it's, it's a hypothesis that's currently being tested with more data. But the thought is that, okay, via one of the mechanisms earlier, we create these floor facula and craters, and then what happens is that other impacts come, they churn the material, they, 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 they mess it up, and that we end up with bright spots in multiple places on the surface, on the rims, on the ejecta. Sometimes they destroy the initial deposit. We think we can place a time scale on this by looking at how quickly bright material becomes dark. One of the things that we were able to trace as a function of crater age, so uh, craters are older here at the bottom of the figure, they're younger at the top, so our bright spots start out bright, and then over time, they darken. And so this allows us to fingerprint how long ago did they form. And I'm not going to belabor the model that went into the, the answer because it, it, is, uh, it, it would take up the entire remainder of our time, including our question period. But the thought is that I'll just hit the bottom line, which is that it's on the order of hundreds of millions of years and, and not billions of years. You might say, that is still a long time ago, <laughs> which is true. But to a geologist, this is really important because the solar system formed four and a half billion years ago, and a lot of those asteroids have been sort of dead rocks ever since. Maybe they occasionally collide with each other, but nothing much has happened. No action for four and a half billion years. So to identify that, like just on average, the bright spots are forming on the under order of hundreds of millions of years ago, means that there are some that are pretty darn recent, like that big cryovolcanic dome that I showed in the center of Akador Crater. So some of these are recent, and it's probably a process that's still going on on Ceres today. Ceres is an unusual, active place. So I'll take some questions, and I'll end with saying the key takeaways. So this dwarf planet has an ice-rich crust with ammonium phyllosilicates that are maybe the fingerprints of the fact that Ceres and the materials that make it came from the outer solar system and it's been tossed inward. I think that is a, a question, uh, so we will need to get some landed data to test it. 
I think um, how recently and how close to the surface was there actually liquid water, like not just the salt residues of water, but actual liquid water itself uh, is a really important question that we're left with after the dawn mission. The team and I think others in the community are going to continue to churn away at the data and see how close we can get to answering that. Um, but that's important because if we think about you know, water in the solar system, on Earth where there's water, there's life. On Ceres, it's crazy to think that there might be life on an asteroid, so I, I often don't think about it. But it could be. You never know. At the very least, this, this says something about, organic, or about chemistry on an asteroid, organic chemistry, delivery of water. And we think a lot of the, the water and organics that were originally on the surface of Earth during our accretion came from the asteroids. So Ceres is going to be an intriguing place to go to follow up. A lot of the questions, though, I think have revealed that Ceres would be a rich, amazing target to send a future mission to land on, to rove to these salt deposits, to sound the surface with radar to see if there's liquid water underneath the surface, uh, because that would make it an even more exciting dwarf planet than it already is. So I'll, I'll leave it with that and take any questions. <laughs> any questions about Ceres? Yes, sir. What is the gravity on Ceres? Uh, what is the gravity on Ceres? So I don't know right off the top of my head, but I do see Carol Polanski's in the room, who's a member of the Dawn team. Do you happen to know off the top of your head? I don't either. <laughs> Yeah, it's something I think it's on the order. It's on the order of I think a hundredth or so. Why do you ask? Yeah. Yeah, so basically, okay, so you're asking, I knew there was a motivation, you didn't want me to just spout off a number and declare content. Uh, so the motivation behind the question is, how might you land and how might you move around on, if you were to land on Ceres and, and explore it, how would you land and how would you move around? And the answer is that you would do a rocket-powered descent, similar to the way uh, that astronauts landed on the moon, Right? Think about that descent, and you saw at the beginning of the talk that Ceres is, you know, Ceres is about that big, and the moon's like that big, right? So, so you do a rocket powered descent, and then because the gravity is low, you would have some ability to hop. Probably you wouldn't want to go all the way up out of the gravity well and come back down again. That, that would, might be a little prohibitive on the fuel front, but you could certainly hop, you know, a few kilometers, maybe from the bright spot to the dark spot, to a dark patch, or vice versa. Yep. You had a question in the front. Yes. Jackhammer on Ceres, okay. Would Ceres explode? Or would your jackhammer explode? <laughs> kind of both. Okay, what would happen? Okay, um, I don't, I've never thought of this question before. So we can think about it real time. So first of all, the gravity is going to be low. So you have to figure out a way to stabilize yourself while you're jackhammering. Otherwise, you're going to jackhammer yourself off into space. So let's assume that you and your jackhammer are sort of stabilized and you're able to apply it to the surface. So what you'd first go through is you'd go through that dark material, the ammonium phyllosilicate, but I said it was really soft, right? So it'll probably just pulverize beneath your jackhammer. And then you will get to that water ice that's at least 30% water ice. And so we're not exactly sure what that's like. If it's only 30% water ice, it's probably, it's more soil than it is ice. So it would probably break apart and pulverize. But if it's more ice than soil, if we're wrong in our numbers, your jackhammer might have to jackhammer a lot because ice is pretty hard, right? And this is a very good question because this is the kind of thing that engineers at JPL who might want to drill on a series lander and collect a sample and bring it into the lander have to think about. So your question is very good. Thanks. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, in the back. Could someone who's in between me and the gentleman ask the, asking the question repeat the gist of the question? Because I'm having trouble hearing. So, 
Oh, OK. Maybe. Maybe I'm going to try to answer your question. If I don't do a good job answering it, you'll have to come find me um, after this lecture. So I think what you're saying is that if an asteroid hit Ceres or flew by Ceres, could it remove the dust and reveal the bright spots? Is that the gist of your question? Uh, yeah, the answer is, if it hits Ceres, yes. In fact, that's what we think has happened in some of these craters, that it hits those big deposits of salt, some of which may have been buried, and then throws them up uh, into the ejecta of the crater so that they can be seen. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things that we think is happening. Yep, other questions? Uh, yes? Well, uh, and you're saying Mars is fair game because I mentioned it in my intro? <laughs> Go for it, sure. Um, is there any mission in the works where the Earth, they're going to try to actually find a micro fossil on Mars? Yeah, so I, I mean, one of the questions, right, is is there life anywhere else in, our, in the universe, number one, but in our solar system most immediately in terms of being able to visit it? Uh, so the answer is yes. Then the two missions from now, there's a rover that's going in 2020 that has the ability to look for organic molecules and, and potential fossils uh, in rocks uh, if they're there. It's going to make a lot of other measurements uh, for science and for understanding the history of Mars too. But yeah, it does have the potential of looking for life. And those are some of the similar things that we want to bring to the icy worlds of the outer solar system and to potentially even the places like Ceres. Yep. Good question. Yes? Um, so the, you mentioned there are some brine towns, or possibly a brine town on Ceres. Is it like the same kind of brine town on Mars? Uh, is it the same kind of brine on Mars? Interesting question. The answer is it appears no, that the chemistry is different. The Ceres brines seem to have these ammonia and sodium carbonates, these really alkaline, sodic, high pH. Uh, materials that are like Searles Lake and like Enceladus. On Mars, most of the evidence for brines that we've seen so far have been like chloride brines, like think salt like our ocean water salt, or have been sulfate brines, like, like when you get a lot of evaporation, you sometimes get sulfate. So, so far it looks like the chemistry is actually kind of different, and that's maybe saying something. I think, do we have time for how many more questions? Uh, One? Yeah, One? Two One? Two? One, two? Questions. Two, two, okay, okay, oh gosh, so now all the questions reveal themselves. All right, yes. So this indicates, the brine indicates that it came from outer, uh, uh, beyond the uh, asteroid belt, it came into the asteroid belt. Does that have a relationship with why the asteroid belt has been cleared out? Whoa, whoa. Uh, does that have a relationship with why the asteroid belt hasn't totally cleared out? Like why you're asking why there's any material at all? Yeah, or. So Well, let's see. Uh, I'm not sure 100% how to answer that question, but uh, we think the asteroid belt exists uh, in part like with material that basically formed in that region, but either never formed a planet or formed a very small kind of protoplanet that was then disrupted by the giant planets uh, moving in and out such that collisions broke it apart but that debris largely remained. Uh, but the other aspect for why we think that material from Ceres is there, we also see there's, I don't know if you've ever had someone come in and talk about main belt comets. Those are also weird. They're, they're asteroids that every once in a while get a tail, like they become active. So it seems like we also have some icy interlopers um, from the outer solar system that have come inward, probably due to the scattering from the giant planets. And Ceres may be the most um, sort of astonishing one of these. So there was one question in the middle. I, I'll take yeah, that as a final question. Other people can find me after. Yeah. No ammonium phyllosilicates on Vesta. Vesta is a totally different beast and is the subject of another talk. Uh, it's a rocky kind of igneous rock, basically pyroxene, just like you'd find if you went to the volcanoes of Hawaii. It's an igneous rock. Although, interestingly, in a few patches on Vesta, there are evidence of hydrous minerals that look like they were delivered by something impacting Vesta and leaving behind a debris of hydrous minerals. So the asteroid belt is an exciting place. It collects stuff from all over, and it's all there for us to study. So I'll leave it with that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so thank you all very much for coming, and let's thank Professor Ullman again.
Great. Thanks. So as I said before, uh, if you still have remaining questions, I saw a lot of hands up. Uh, we're going to have a question and answer panel that's going to set up in about uh, 10 minutes or so. And in the meantime, uh, you I don't can know. find me. Yeah. yeah. Professor Elman seems like she's happy to take more questions if you'd like to go talk to her. And uh, as I said before, no observing tonight, unfortunately. Uh, I think we're going to start our question and answer panel pretty soon. So thank you all for coming. Uh -huh. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So why don't we, uh, oh, and let's thank uh, Dr. Ullman again yeah. for a wonderful lecture. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if you have any questions about planetary science or about, like, you know, missions in the solar system or uh, series, we're all just going to forward them to Nathan because, <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> the three of us uh, are all, uh, we all work on explosions of various kinds uh, that occur many, many, many solar system sizes away from the Earth. <laughs> but uh, we also generally um, work on a bunch of other things in astronomy. So maybe let's just go around and introduce ourselves real quick. So uh, my name is Dylan, as I said before, uh, and I am a radio astronomer who uses the Very Large Array, which is a set of 27 antennas out, like, like giant satellite dishes, you know, uh, nearly the size of this room. Um, and there are 27 of them out in the deserts of New Mexico. And what we're doing with these dishes is we're making images of the entire sky and we're going to do this three times over seven years. And basically, just look at anything in the sky that's changed over that time. And I'm particularly interested in finding various explosions that are bright in the radio. Before this, I used the same instrument to target nearby galaxies and look for the signatures of young stars being born. So you can ask me about that as well. I'm Nathan. I'm a planetary scientist. I work just across the road. Um, I work on a few things. So I work on Ceres with Bethany, looking at the bright spots that you heard something about. Um, I also work on the Curiosity rover, which is one of the Mars rovers. So I help to drive it and then uh, also look at sedimentology and stratigraphy with the rover. Um, so interpreting the, ro the rocks that the rover is driving on and trying to figure out what the environment was like uh, three, three and a half billion years ago, um, where the rover is now on Mars. Um, and then I, I also work on uh, building drones and integrating spectrometers, the same kinds of instruments that Bethany was talking about, um, uh, integrating spectrometers with UAVs for flying them over remote field sites, um, and hopefully eventually integrating that kind of technology, um, the miniaturized imaging spectroscopy, onto future space missions to various bodies. Hello, uh, my name is Gao. Uh, I'm a fourth year, uh, fourth year grad, grad student here in astronomy department, and I'm interested in boring supernovae. So there are different multiple kinds of supernovae, and uh, the most, one of the most typical ones are uh, from massive stars that are at the end of their life, and they run out of nuclear fuel at the center, and they collapse and then explode. So th these are very common, but the problem is we still don't know everything about it. We still don't know how the explosion actually happens. And uh, my, my research focuses on very bright, very nearby events that we can, that we can study a, uh, a lot of details, um, in a lot of details. And I'm particularly interested in looking at these events in the infrared part of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, what infrared can give you is that um, you can follow, follow up these supernovae for hundreds, if not thousands of days after the explosion. So you can look at the same event for, for a few years, even 10 years. So that's what I do. Is that everything I say? And if you have questions about giant planet or brown dwarfs, I might be able to help answer that too. OK, so uh, my name is Kishale. I'm also a grad student here in the astronomy department. So. Uh, my work primarily focuses on finding supernovae, the stuff that Gao was talking about. So I uh, run, I'm currently involved with two surveys, one that operates in the optical, optical wavelengths, there's light that you can actually see, and another survey that 
works at infrared wavelengths, which is longer wavelength light than what our eyes can detect, but they allow you to probe different kinds of environments than what the optical light does. So both of these surveys are running from Palomar Mountain, which is down in San Diego, uh, about a couple of hours drive from here. And what we do is we take the, a couple of small telescopes, we look at the sky every night. And you know, we take pictures of the sky every night, and whenever there's a new star that appears in any galaxy, we follow, follow up on that. We get a bigger telescope, get a spectrum of the object, and try to understand what kind of a supernova is it, and you know, what could have caused the supernova, and so on. So, yeah, that's, yeah. So, that's it. Oh, that's uh, okay. The, the, okay. So the question is, how do we find new stars? Oh, how often? Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So the question is, how often do we find new stars? So, um, the so the universe is actually turns out to be a reasonably violent place. So that finding new stars is actually very common, more common than I think what we'd like it to be, <laughs> because often, oftentimes, when you have a big enough telescope, well, even with you know a small telescope, which is say a um, meter-sized telescope, we, you are, we are typically sensitive enough to find about 10 explosions every night. So we find 10 of these supernovae every night. And more often than not, we do not have enough resources to follow them up because it just takes a lot of time on big, a bigger telescope to you know, classify that supernova and say this was, whether this was from the explosion of a massive star or something else. So yes, it's finding supernovae turns out to be actually really... Um, common. These things are really common in the universe. Oh, right. So, uh, so, f so, photographic plates were really the you know what w what was done in the really old days. So, the question is, how do we find these supernovae? Um, so, what we use today are CCD detectors uh, in the optical, where the idea is you take your telescope, which has uh, a CCD camera mounted on it. And you record the image of the of the image of the sky on that CCD camera, and you store it on a computer. And there is an entire computer which is reducing terabytes of data every night, trying to um, look for stars that were there on one night but were not there on the previous night. And that tells you that this thing should have appeared tonight because it wasn't there on the previous night. But it's really today everything is digital. Everything is done by computers. Okay, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, so the question is, uh, what do I think the odds are of Ceres having a magnetic field? Um, uh, you know, people speculate on the um, composition and size of the core on the basis of um, basically how the spacecraft as it orbits series is um, affected and how its orbit changes. And so there, there are models that go into a little bit uh, of the composition and size of the core. Um, and, you know, w whether it has something like a, a dynamo, um, I, don't, I don't know if I know enough about the composition to, to speculate on that. Um, there are many much larger objects that don't. Um, and, and so it may be surprising if it does. Okay, so the question uh, was, what motivates us to study space? And I'm sure that each of the four of us has a different motivation, and so maybe let's just go down the panel. Um, so for myself, uh, I think I sort of just stumbled into this field. Uh, it, was, it was sort of by accident. Uh, I had a really, really good introduction to astronomy class taught by Professor Phil Choi. I went to Pomona College, which some of you might know is like 25 miles away from here. And, you know, I, I was really into all the things that he was teaching. And he was like, well, you know, uh, since you're so interested in astronomy, you may as well just, like, go look for a summer research job. And he pointed me in the right direction. In fact, uh, Carnegie Observatories, which is having this open house on Sunday, was uh, the place where I had my first astronomy job. 
and I sort of fell in love from there. Uh, you know, it's really cool thinking that uh, just by writing a few lines of computer code, uh, I can be studying you know events that happen like millions of light years away, right? And uh, it sort of gives you a, a grand picture of the, the history of the universe and sort of our place in it and all the dynamic things that are happening every night. Like Kishley said, you know, we find supernovae, like 10 supernovae every night, and these are just the close ones to us. Uh, one of our professors here, uh, Sri Kulkarni, likes to say that there's a supernova happening somewhere in the universe every second. You know, there's a massive star that's just reached the end of its millions of years long life and its core is collapsed and it's rebounded and maybe a black hole is formed in the middle or maybe a neutron star was formed in the middle and it's blown up and this happens every second. And so there's, there's so much cool stuff that's going out there and I wanna learn about it all and I wanna find out. So that's for me. Yeah, I, I, I would echo especially the second part. You know, it's it, once you get into it, it's kind of um, surreal in some ways to um, be taking part. And, you know, in, in my case, uh, you know, they're working on, on broad surveys that represent the, the collective effort of a whole lot of people. And that's true in planetary missions, too. Um, you know, it's, there are a whole lot of people that go into operating a, a robot on Mars or even a spacecraft orbiting series. But early on, I actually got into... Um, I got interested in space because it's it's actually what my dad does, um, and so it, ever since I was five or six, that's kind of what I wanted to do. I I dreamed for a while about playing baseball, but that didn't pan out. <laughs> What's that? Oh, for a while I I had aspirations of of playing baseball growing up in St. Louis, but didn't pan out. <laughs> yeah. Um. Let's see. For me, I I think the best explanation of astronomy. Uh, I've heard is that it's the most well-funded art <laughs> in terms that, uh, you know, results from astronomy will not, like, directly impact the way people live uh, in some sense. Although there are some, uh, you know, like, practical uh, things that come out of astronomy too, like digital imaging is is a huge part of, of astronomy, and, and we, we had it before it became com commercially available for many years, for example, and there are also other things. Um, for me, I, I, I think the big part of, of, uh, of my interest in, in, in astronomy is that I think astronomy gives us like a, 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 a largest overview of, of all things around us. And is, uh, I think people like to, to say that um, it makes you, you know, feel humble and small among this vastness of universe. But I also think it, it, it also makes us feel a little smug that we, you know, just confined on, the, on our tiny ball of Earth can learn so much about astronomy and can learn so much about things millions of light years away through our uh, creativity and, yeah, so that's for me. Um, right, so I think I uh, I want to start by picking up the point that Gao raised, which is this technology development. So yeah, so even though it might not be obvious, it turns out that astronomy actually today drives a lot of the technology development that is done for the next generation of you know of how humans will live. You know, today there is this big telescope called the Square Kilometer Array that is being planned that will be deployed in South Africa and Australia, and the computers that they are building for the square kilometer array, they are the amount of data that will ha that the single telescope will handle is going to be larger than the entire internet data volume that the current planet is sustaining right now. So, and doing that kind of stuff really requires you to go deep, deeper and deeper into the the far reaches of the human possibilities of technology. So, and you know, even things like. Uh, the GPS on your cell phone. The GPS on your cell phone is driven by our understanding of the general theory of relativity, which is gravity. And we find, you know, general theory, the, the theory of relativity was, you know, was proposed almost 100 years ago. And the verification for that really first came from astronomers who were trying to look at stars and verify all this. So GPS would not have been possible without the theory of relativity. There's just way too many things going on over there. So, yeah, I think, you know, Astronomy has been 
particularly useful in driving the development of technology, but, oh, so, right, so uh, I think we were talking about what drove us into this. So I think, uh, um, so uh, for me personally, I think I grew up being kind of an amateur astronomer. I just liked looking at the stars in the skies. And uh, when I uh, was, you know, and started doing undergrad and actually learning some of the physics that uh, was involved in astronomy, I thought, you know, it's kind of the perfect job. Like I, uh, you know, I I get a living out of doing the things that I actually like to do as a hobby. So I don't think there's a better way to really explain that. So, um, but even otherwise, I think you know, if you look at the more fundamental questions that we are trying to answer, well, at least in my field, well, why do we study supernovae at all? So one of the uh, primary reasons why supernovae are really interesting on, in 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 a broader picture of astronomy is because uh, we know that when the universe was formed, the universe was made up of only uh, hydrogen and helium for the most part, and there was nothing else in the universe. But you know, look around you today. There is very, well, very little hydrogen and helium. Actually, most of the stuff that you see around you is not hydrogen and helium. It, these are metals. These are these are metals that are heavier than hydrogen and helium. You know, iron, oxygen, calcium, all of this stuff. The calcium in your bones the iron in your blood, all of this stuff was made inside some kind of a supernova that exploded m several millions of years ago. You, every single iron atom inside your body was made inside a supernova. So, you know, just going back and trying to understand these beasts, these extremely powerful explosions, helps you understand where did we come from. Because we would not have been possible if these supernovae didn't go off in the universe. Wish list. <laughs> Anyone? We all have grand wish lists. Oh man, I'm being put on the spot. Uh, I'm really glad that I'm at the point in my career where I don't really have to worry about funding. My advisor just, you know. Uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the flip side of that is that you know I'm not really writing these proposals to build giant instruments. However, my advisor uh, does have this grand idea, which is called, uh, so I don't know if some of you went to uh, Greg Hallinan's talk on fast radio bursts or mysterious flashes of radio waves from deep space, as he calls them. Um, he gave one like a few months ago. Uh, but one of the leading instruments right now uh, that's in development that will be uh, finding where these mysterious flashes come from uh, is called the Deep Synoptic Array. We're building this out in the Owens Valley Radio Observatory uh, up Highway 395. If you just drive east for maybe like two hours and then drive north for maybe two hours on the other side of the Sierra Nevada Mountains, uh, you'll find Owens Valley. Um, and basically what this is, is you're taking lots of little tiny satellite dishes and you're turning them into one giant telescope. And right now... Uh, there are 10 of these dishes. Uh, pretty soon, there'll be like 100 of them. Uh, my advisor wants to build 2,000. And it turns out that 2,000 is kind of a magic number. Uh, right now, one of the rate-limiting steps in making images with this collection of satellite dishes is that you have to do a lot of computer processing to turn the signals that are coming in into images. And I won't really get into the details. But it turns out that once you have about 2,000, you can skip one giant step. Uh, you'll, you'll turn your, you, you, instead of having to spend hours processing this data, it'll be out in like less than a second, the image. And so basically what you'll have is you'll have a radio video camera that will be constantly looking at the sky and uh, you'll have real time sort of video of the whole sky. And I think that that's something that would be really cool. And, you know, actually within the realm of regular funding, like you wouldn't even need a blank check for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, let's take another question. Yeah. We can come back to that if we have time. Yeah, we can come back.
Yeah, it's, it's actually a good question. Um, so, you know, the, the asteroid belt, as Bethany was kind of hinting, is made up of a whole lot of objects that have probably been involved in collisions in the past in some form. Um, when you see things like metallic meteorites, um, the fact that they're metallic, that they're made of metal, might indicate that they were at one point uh, at the center of some larger body, and, and they've heated up and the metal sunk to the, the center, to the core, and then a big impactor came in um, and basically blew the entire thing up. And so, uh, you know, it's thought that early in the solar system, there were a lot of fairly large bodies called planetesimals, about the size of Ceres, that were hitting each other, um, and uh, often with enough energy to, to break each other apart. Um, it, it turns out that even if you have a small impactor, say uh, an impactor that's hitting Ceres that isn't big enough to break apart Ceres, um, but say is big enough to form um, the craters that you saw, there's still enough energy there to produce melt. Um, it's called impact heating and impact melt. It doesn't melt the entire body, um, but it, it might melt enough of the material at the center to change its composition. Um, and you know, in, in the distant past, even on Earth, for example, when impacts were a lot more common in the inner solar system, there might have been enough impacts into Earth that the entire surface may have been molten. So um, it, to answer your question directly, whether um, things would just melt or break apart, it depends on what it's hitting and how quickly it's happening. But some some part of both of those things would be happening. Yeah. <laughs> you won't want to be there. Yeah, so the question was, uh, so to give a little bit of context to the question before I repeat the question, uh, part of the power of the VLA, the instrument that I work with, is that these dishes are separated by, from each other by you know many miles, or tens of miles or so. Uh, and the farther apart they are, the better resolution we are, the smaller details we can pick out. Um, and so the idea is, uh, you know, maybe we can put some radio telescopes in space. Uh, and we can get a huge distance between the telescopes and be able to uh, resolve really, really small things. And as far as I'm aware, uh, there's only one mission where this has been done. There is a uh, satellite operated by uh, Radio Astron, which um, I think is out of like the Netherlands and Russia uh, that basically uh, works with the global um, very long baseline array um, and together they can make images or, or really uh, take data that is sensitive to extremely small scales. Um, I'm not super aware of uh, projects that are going to actually happen that will send more uh, dishes into space, partly because it's, extre it's extremely expensive and partly because uh, it's very, very technically difficult to do. Because the way that you can uh, get information is by knowing precisely where your dish is located, like down to a fraction of a wavelength, right? So you have something that's hurtling along at like tens of thousands of kilometers you know, per hour, and you need to know its position at all times within like a centimeter. And that's very, very difficult to do. Uh, and so uh, the other thing is that um, the processing challenges for the data become much, much harder. 
because you you have to basically like you can think of an array of dishes uh, like simulating one big dish. So let's say that you had a dish here and 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 a dish here. Basically, it would be like one big telescope, except you had holes everywhere except for where you had the dishes, right? And you're just trying to fill in, you know, this giant, like all these holes uh, using fancy computer algorithms. Uh, now, what if you had a dish, or what if you had a radio antenna all the way here? Instead of just having to fill in this area, you would have to fill in this entire area, right? And that becomes much, much less reliable and much more difficult. Um, and so, really, uh, to do this properly, you'd have to have a huge fleet in space. <laughs> and I think we're a little far away from that, but maybe with your blank check, we can do it one day. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Um, well, take a question from you. Hmm. The question is, how many dwarf planets are there? I don't actually know the answer, but what, whatever the, the current answer is, the real answer is a lot more than that. Um, so the Ceres is the closest dwarf planet to the sun, and if you walked across the street and into the office of Mike Brown, he could tell you about the, the many other dwarf planets that he's helped to discover that are, are quite a bit farther out in the solar system. Um, and in fact, I think as recently as, as last week, there was a, another one that uh, was announced. And so um, it's a, at least five. And as, as we go forward, um, I'm sure many more will be discovered you know, far out in the solar system. It, we're talking about uh, orbits that are far beyond Neptune and Pluto um, and highly elliptical orbits too. So they might only come to uh, close enough for us to see um, you know, very infrequently on the order of many hundreds of years. It's a good question. Yeah, so uh, the question was, it's very hard to track exactly where uh, the, these telescopes are uh, accurately, but there is a proposed mission, which actually uh, is going to be launched, uh, hopefully in the 2030s or so, called LISA, which uh, is going to be three uh, spacecraft orbiting in a triangle in space. And um, wouldn't it be also difficult to, to track those uh, I think what matters for Lisa, and I'm not an expert in this at all, uh, is just the relative distances between uh, the three telescopes. It's not the distance between those telescopes and Earth, necessarily. And so um, I think they have some fancy system. Maybe somebody else knows a lot more about this than me. Uh, of like, there's like some sort of weight that, or in some gyroscopes that they can use to calibrate. Um, their relative location. I'm not quite sure. Uh, there's also going to be like, uh, you know, lasers that are firing in between the three, right? Uh, and so it's it's operating on a sort of, sort of different principle. Um, Possibly. I mean, uh, you might be able to overcome uh, challenges with tracking that way, but I really don't know. Yeah, I, I think what makes LISA maybe somewhat easier to do than uh, teles uh, radio telescope array in space is, or from what I can think of, two things. One is that the space, spacecraft for LISA itself doesn't have to be huge. Uh, all it has to do is to shoot laser out. But with a radio telescope, to get some sensitivity, like even though you can you can try to use many telescopes to fill in this huge disk, you still need the telescope itself to be big enough to collect data, and that would be a huge challenge that you you need uh, uh, to send a large spacecraft out. Um, but LISA itself is, is small, uh, which is also my second point. <laughs> that is, uh, for LISA, the detection itself is done by the laser beam between the spacecraft as opposed to by the spacecraft itself.
The answer is very complicated. <laughs> And um, I, I think certain people are, are more enthusiastic and in favor of the process than others. So Dawn is um, uh, what's called a discovery class mission. And NASA has different classes of missions. Um, they're kind of grouped by cost. And you know, so this is a, a relatively inexpensive mission coming in at several hundred million dollars. Uh, Curiosity for reference is about 2.6 billion. Uh, and the, the most expensive flagship missions are in excess of $4 billion um, for robotic missions, things like Cassini. And so uh, what happens with, with this class of mission is that uh, NASA will put out an AO, uh, an announcement of opportunity, and groups will come together um, with a proposal for um, where they want to go, what science questions they want to address, and um, what instruments they'll carry. And then they'll demonstrate to NASA that they can do all that under some um, cost. And uh, NASA will go through some number of proposals. It could be many dozens of proposals. Um, and, and they'll winnow it down uh, to some number that falls uh, within um, the objectives that are outlined in a dec decadal survey. So every decade, um, a large group of planetary scientists comes together and basically assesses um, what NASA has done in the previous decade, uh, how well it's answered the questions that were previously laid out, and what questions remain, or the, the most interesting questions uh, that are left to answer or that are most feasible in the next, next decade. And so the missions that address those primary questions that are outlined in the decadal survey uh, are typically the ones that are, are weighted the most heavily. Um, and, and so you can see th as the missions are set up for the future, um, they're kind of falling into um, distinct classes. There's, there's a shift back to the moon. Uh, the Mars program continues to be healthy. Mars 2020, the next rover, um, is, is possibly the first in a series of sample return missions. Um, and then there's also a focus that's shifting toward the outer solar system, looking at the Galilean moons um, and potentially also a, a mission to Titan, so looking at ocean worlds farther out in the solar system. And that's all in response to uh, the previous decadal survey. So it's a long process, um, but ultimately Ceres was um, deemed to be an object of interest along with Vesta. You know, it's, it's kind of a two-for-one mission um, because it represents um, kind of a, a gateway, a transition between the inner and the outer solar system and helps to understand the processes that were happening early on in the solar system uh, to form the bodies that we see today. So, um, <laughs> yes, so the, the question is uh, what would happen or uh, what would happen to the sun when it fills, runs out and how long would that take? Also, what would happen to the earth and the solar system? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the sun is um, what, what we call like a low mass star, so it will not explode as a supernova, but that is not a good news. <laughs> uh, what, what happens to, to uh, stars like the sun is that when, when the hydrogen in the core runs out, um, it, the, the star itself will, will contract and the helium inside can start to burn. And when you have this uh, helium burning, the outer part of the sun will, will expand out. Uh, I think the current estimate is that it will engulf out to the orbit of Mars. So anything closer, including Earth, will be basically eaten by the sun. So that's not a very good news. The good news is that if you are an alien from, uh, from outside of the solar system looking back, uh, this whole process is, is, can be rather beautiful because the, <laughs> because the outer part of the sun, after it eats the Earth and everything, it will expand out and form this thing called a planetary nebula. It has nothing to do with planet. It just looks like one in a telescope, in a bad telescope. And what, what you have is this, a uh, large shell of gas with very beautiful color and um, yeah, I think you can you can try to Google an, an image afterward. But uh, it's called planetary nebulae, and and these are quite pretty. So, but that that will happen. Uh, that's what would happen with a uh, a star like the sun. 
Yes, so uh, we, we actually don't know that quite well. So the sun is currently about five billion years old, and we think it has five more billion years old years. So, yeah, we we be good. Yes. <laughs> I, th I think, though, to add on to that, that Earth will become hot enough to be inhospitable in about a billion years. So, a little less time. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, yeah, so the question is, um, with Mars 2020, there's a, a plan to bring along a small helicopter and, and whether I'm involved. Uh, I'm not directly involved. I know people who are working on it, and I've seen it. Um, so, you know, Mars 2020 is the next Mars rover, which is being constructed a few miles away right now, um, up at JPL. And they're also in the process of constructing uh, a very small, um, or at least very lightweight um, drone that will accompany um, the rover. And it's it's half of it's useful, half of it's um, kind of a technology demonstration. Um, but basically, the idea is when you land, you you drop this. Uh, it basically has two stacked rotors that are you know, about that long, um, and they're spinning fast enough that even though um, Mars's atmosphere is less than one percent of the density of Earth's, um, you can actually fly. the The wing or the rotor tips are going about the speed of sound, um, as fast as sound is on Mars. Um, and so it's, it's, it's pretty fast. Um, but the idea is that um, it'll be able to do at least a few flights um, out in front of the rover and um, potentially return some low-level imaging data um, to, to scout out ahead. In the future, um, there's a, there is actually a plan, one of two uh, finalists for the next um, kind of big flagship NASA mission, uh, one of these $4 billion missions, uh, is called uh, Dragonfly, which is um, basically a six-rotor uh, drone that would fly on Titan, um, which is the large moon of Saturn. Um, and if, if folks have seen or read about this before, it's it's basically has a methane and ethane uh, rich atmosphere, um, and it's very dense. It's like this big uh, red ball, and it has lakes and, and rivers, like big channel systems that are carved out by uh, methane. And you know, it's carrying cobbles, like rocks of, of water. So a very exotic um, place that is in many ways actually similar um, geomorphologically to the processes that you see on Earth. So those kinds of technologies are viable. Um, and you, know, you can think outside the box a little bit with robotic missions. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's something that is being constructed right now for Mars 2020. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know exactly what um, instruments they'll carry on board. I'm assuming that they'll have uh, a small camera. So, you know, when you're driving a rover, um, the, the priority is to not get it stuck. You're not so much worried about crashing because rovers don't go too quickly. You know, the, the maximum speed of Curiosity is about 4.2 centimeters per second. So, you know, <laughs> it's not super fast. But, you know, what you worry about is getting yourself, uh, you know, going somewhere where you either have to waste a whole lot of time and resources moving around an obstacle or getting yourself into a situation, um, this has happened with multiple rovers, where you're trying to tra traverse um, sand ripples on a slope and the rover embeds, it just spins its wheels in place. It, it thinks it's moving, but it's not. Um, and, and that's even killed one rover in the past, Spirit. Um, and so one of the ideas is that um, in addition to orbital mapping that you get from instruments like HiRISE, which takes images at up to 25 centimeters per pixel in orbit around Mars, you can get even higher resolution from a drone flying ahead and, and scouting out these locations. In the future, you might be able to use those images to do things like photogrammetry, so doing stereo imaging to get higher scale topography. Um, and, and also, you could include potentially spectrometers. I don't think there's a plan to include a spectrometer on, on this mission, but in the future, um, you can imagine a fleet of drones that are able to map surface composition or mineralogy uh, at very high spatial resolution and to do so over uh, a much larger area than what you could accomplish with a rover that's moving slowly. Uh, 
so, th so this is um, with Mars 2020, um, and uh, so Mars is far enough from Earth that there's a significant light delay, and functionally, logistically, what happens with operations is that um, you basically can uplink uh, flight commands, um, or I guess just operation commands um, every day, or even every couple of days, um, using what's called the Deep Space Network, which is a set of um, three um, dishes that you have spread across the Earth and then the orbital assets around Mars. Um, and so I'm guessing whatever flight plans that you have will be uplinked uh, from JPL every day or every other day. Um, and that will probably go through um, the telecommunication systems that are on the rover itself and then be relayed um, in some fashion to the drone. Uh, and the drone will carry some significant uh, autonomy with it. I don't think it'll be fully autonomous, but it'll be smart enough to know where to land and where not to land. <laughs> um, right, so the request is for a private tour of Palomar. <laughs> um, I mean, there are, I mean, it's, uh, Palomar is actually completely open to the public, so you can actually go there and look at the telescopes, yeah. Not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, there, there, there's a scheduled tour that you can take. Yeah, you can. Um, I, I don't know, know this. I think it's available in the summer. You should go on the website and, and you should say something there. Yeah, I, I think there are ways to go inside. Yeah. Without knowing the yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah um, one of the, I'm not sure if it's worth the effort to take account of different population structures. Try to start on that, but okay. So the uh, the question is, um, when we look at stars in the galaxy, why is it that certain types of stars appear in certain regions of the galaxy, and you know other types of stars appear in other regions of the galaxy? Is that yeah. is that right? Okay, um, right. So so for if you look at a galaxy like our own Milky Way, so the Milky Way is a in some sense a typical spiral galaxy. It has if you look at so. Pictures of the Milky Way are not of the Milky Way, so don't believe <laughs> the internet. So pictures of the Milky Way are of galaxies that we think look like the Milky Way. In reality, there is, even today, quite a lot of debate about what exactly the Milky Way looks like. Um, and that is you know, quite a topic of research even today. Um, but for a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way, uh, if you look at the, sp if you try t took a telescope and looked at the stars in those spiral arms, they will turn out to be very young, massive stars. And the reason for that is that it's, it's just the way these galaxies are formed. When these galaxies are formed, when these spiral arms are formed, these spiral arms are just regions of the galaxy where a lot of, it, there is a lot of gas, and these gas clouds collapse, and they produce hot, young stars. So if you look at a spiral arm, the reason you see it as a spiral arm is because these regions are producing a lot of hot, young stars. So they immediately appear quite, you know, quite bright in any image. So, um, so a typical spiral arm will have a lot of hot young stars. But if you go and look at, say, either, um, if you look at the very far outskirts of a galaxy, say, you know, the, if you look um, about 100,000 light years away from the galaxy, and you took a star over there and looked at it, then what you will typically find is that that star is actually a very old star. It's not a hot young star. And the reason for that is, is as simple as saying that most stars in the galaxy are formed in these spiral arms at some point in its history. The Milky Way is, you know, is, about, is a few billion years old since it was formed. And almost all of the stars that are part of the Milky Way were formed somewhat close to where the, spiral, where the, where the disk of the galaxy is. So whenever you see a star that is really far away from the disk of the galaxy, it means that it has actually traveled very far away from the galaxy. 
And in order to have traveled 100,000 light years away, it must have formed a few billion years ago. It's just, it's just a lifetime thing. You know, if you see something really far away, it must have already had a lot of time in its, during its lifetime to have traveled that far away. So, that it's, 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 it's a, so that, that's true for a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way. But there are other kinds of galaxies. There are, there are these things known as elliptical galaxies. Now, elliptical galaxies are galaxies which are much, much older than what our Milky Way is today. And the elliptical galaxies, you, you, it's very rare to find hot young stars in an elliptical galaxy, simply because these galaxies are so old. Most of the hot young stars, they've already died, they've exploded already, and they've left behind material for the next generation of stars to form. So if you look at an elliptical galaxy, which is not like the Milky Way, then most of the stars you will see are you know, stars which are you know, 10 billion years old. Because all the, the elliptical galaxy really did all of its star formation way before um, what, what you see it today. Yeah, so uh, one complication to this picture, I think, is that uh, big galaxies like the Milky Way are thought to have assembled from many, many what are called hierarchical mergers of galaxies. So you have lots of small galaxies that crash into each other, and you know they sort of get torn apart, and eventually uh, all those stars get scattered into the pattern that we see today in our galaxy. And so when you look out to the farthest reaches of the galactic halo, you know, uh, as Keish Lee was saying, 100,000 light years away, a lot of these stars that you're seeing are relics from very, very, uh, from galaxy mergers that happened a very long time ago. Um, also, there, there are a few streams that we can detect uh, that are current dwarf galaxies that are being shredded. So there's one famous one that's called the Sagittarius stream, for example. Um, and... So it turns out that stars that are in dwarf galaxies uh, tend to be much, much less rich in what astronomers call metals. And again, it's a bit of a stupid astronomer terminology. Metals are anything that are heavier than helium. Um, and so uh, that sort of contributes to sort of the, uh, the low metal population out there as well. Mm -hmm. Just to finish off, you, you asked about population one and two. Those are kind of like historical terms. Because initially, all, all we see is, are just bright stars that are in the disk. So we call that population one. And uh, the characteristic of population one star is that it has a lot of metal, which are things that are heavier than helium. And that's because these things are young, and they are born off of materials from older stars. And then uh, once we have better sensitivity, we started to detect these fainter stars in the Milky Way that have lower metallicity, so uh, low amount of things heavier than helium. So they call the, those population two. And now we know that population one are stars in the disk, and population two are stars that are more dispersed around Milky Way. Yeah, so it's just some like, historical terms that stick around. <laughs> Anyone in the room? <laughs> Jar Jar Binks, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so... Uh, the debate over what is a planet and what isn't um, goes back quite a ways, and it's become more complicated um, as our picture of the solar system has grown more complicated. Um, so, you know, Pl Pluto to begin with, we know is is kind of a strange object uh, relative to the other planets in that its orbit is pretty elliptical. So occasionally it's closer to the sun than uh, Neptune even. And if you look at how it orbits relative to the, uh, the plane uh, in which most of the other planets are orbiting the sun, you can see it's also tilted uh, quite a bit. And so um, folks have come up with a number of criteria that um, distinguish things like 
dwarf planets um, from what you would call a planet for those other eight bodies. Um, one of those things is being able to clear your own uh, orbit. So Ceres, for example, um, although it comprises a third of the mass of the asteroid belt, uh, is a part of the asteroid belt, which is itself comprised of, of many thousands of, of objects. And so you would say, well, Ceres hasn't been able to clear its own orbit, uh, therefore it's not a planet. Another consideration might be uh, whether the object is actually uh, large enough to round itself under its own gravity. Um, Ceres is, is relatively round, but if you compare it to um, something like the Earth or Venus um, or even the Moon, uh, then it's it's fairly oblate. It's an oblate spheroid, which actually everything is. Um, but in the case of Vesta, which you didn't see a picture of tonight, um, it's just a little bit smaller than Ceres, but it's, it's actually not quite massive enough to round itself. Um, if you look at Pluto, uh, Pluto's a little bit bigger, but you can say, well, hey, it's bigger, it's round, but um, it, it has a moon, um, Karen, which is something like, what, 40% of its diameter, 40 or 50%, and I think even more relative um, to its mass. And so um, if you go ask Mike Brown, he'll tell you emphatically that Pluto isn't a planet. His Twitter handle is, is literally Pluto Killer. Um, and he has a sign, a letter on his door written by an elementary schooler, like pleading him uh, for him to make Pluto a planet again. And so he takes pride in this. Um, but there are a number of people who, who really vehemently disagree. Um, so, you know, New Horizons um, was the mission that flew past Pluto um, a little more than a year or two ago. Um, and is actually coming up on an encounter with another object in the Kuiper Belt. Um, and so the leaders of that mission are, are pretty uh, emphatic to the point of, I think, having an editorial in the Washington Post uh, a couple months ago pleading uh, the case for Pluto to, to be designated as a planet. The issue that I have with that is if you go back to criteria where Pluto becomes a planet, you have a whole lot of other objects that need to be planets. And um, as I was mentioning earlier with another question, uh, we're only going to discover more objects that are in the class of things like Ceres um, that we would consider dwarf planets. And so, you know, if you want to have kids memorize 50 planets, that's fine. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, something's got to give. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, it, it really comes down to a, a question of semantics. I mean, Pluto, um, if you have gone and looked at the data from New Horizons, is, is really a, a beautiful uh, and fantastically interesting place. Um, and I, I think the point here is, you know, Ceres is, I think, like the 33rd uh, largest object in the solar system, but it's, it's still uh, intriguing enough that there are a whole lot of questions um, that remain to be answered about it. Um, to the point where it's in many ways uh, reformulating a lot of the things that we know about how uh, other larger bodies formed and the kind of processes that are happening in them. Ceres, for example, is um, the only body in the solar system where we've confirmed that cryovolcanism, ice-driven volcanism, is taking place. And that's postulated to be a large part of the processes that are shaping the surfaces of other bodies farther out in the solar system. So. Um, yeah, some people might see it as uh, disrespect toward that body or even toward uh, Clyde Tombaugh who discovered Pluto. Um, but I, I think the, the people who are arguing that Pluto um, shouldn't be called a planet are among the first that would tell you that it's a really interesting place. I can add a bit to that too. Um, is the problem is not uh, only on the, the small size and uh, with so exoplanet didn't get uh, as much coverage tonight, so I, I, I want to give some love to exoplanet people. My advisor is an uh, exoplanet person. Um, so when we look outside of our solar system, we see uh, a whole different type of planets that we don't see in the solar system, and a lot of them are uh, several times more massive than Jupiter, which is our, most, our biggest planet. So the question... Uh, uh, in addition to the low, low end of the mass, it's also how, how massive a, an object can be before we don't call them planets anymore. And actually, we, we, we don't really have a, a good cutoff right now. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's kind of a, a, a funny problem because uh, most of the uh, survey that find these massive, star, uh, massive planets are called uh, direct imaging 
technique. And this is when you try to block out the star and try to take a direct photograph of the planet orbiting around that star. And to do that, you tend to catch like very massive planets. Now the question is, uh, we, we detect all, like all sort of objects orbiting stars and um, there are no criteria to, to you know, for, for somebody to say that, oh, I found five planets or oh, I found six. It's kind of funny on, <laughs> on the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, so uh, there are many people who believe that there is at least one more planet. Um, and that's actually also work that's been done uh, in large part here at Caltech by Konstantin Batygin and Mike Brown, um, which is if you look at a lot of the objects in the outer solar system um, and um, look at their, their orbits, then there's a preferential scatter um, where their orbits are basically shifted elliptically off in one direction. And um, my understanding is if you um, do the modeling, um, then it indicates that there is a large perturbing body um, that would be required, or at least very probable, um, somewhere far out in the solar system that would have um, affected those orbits that perturb them all in that direction. Um, and actually the, the dwarf planet that was uh, recently discovered is also scattered in that same direction. Um, and so uh, the number that they've come up with is um, a, a body that's somewhere along the size of Neptune. And the issue is, um, uh, you know, you can, you can see a supernova that's really far away because supernovas are pretty bright. They're certainly a little bit brighter than planets. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and especially planets that are so far from the sun. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of looking like looking for uh, a black object against a black background. So there may be ways with current technologies to detect it um, in the next few years, but um, it's difficult. So in theory, um, the folks at Caltech GPS would tell you that, yes, they already know there's a ninth planet. Yeah, I think that, that may have been a moon of Jupiter. Um, and uh, yeah, while it's a moon, it, I think that particular one is pretty small. Um, the, the cool thing with um, missions that go to these places is a, a large component of missions to new bodies is just taking a bunch of pictures and searching for new satellites, um, which Don also did at Ceres. Um, there aren't any satellites at Ceres. Um, but yeah, I, as you mentioned, Jupiter and Saturn have uh, an enormous number of moons. And in many ways, um, certainly if you're interested in, in surface processes um, or things like oceans and habitability, the moons are themselves more interesting than the bodies that they orbit. Um, and so, you know, the Europa Clipper, for example, um, is um, destined to, to go to Jupiter and do many close flybys of Europa. Um, looking both at its surface and surface composition, but also probing the interior to get more information on the, the liquid water ocean that exists there, uh, likely in preparation for a mission in several decades, which would involve a melt probe that would actually try to put something um, in the ocean. So um, there are still a whole lot of objects, even fairly close to Earth, um, that are probably waiting to be discovered, and certainly objects that we know about that haven't been well characterized. Yeah, so it looks like we have time for maybe two more questions. So if anybody has more burning questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's a hard problem. <laughs> and why did they think 
Yeah, well, it, it's hard for a number of reasons. Um, one is it's hard to tell um, if it is or isn't water, um, in part because their resolution um, is fairly low. So uh, the, 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 I should say they're relatively uh, narrow, so the resolution of um, the imagers that we have uh, is relatively low compared to their diameter or their width. And so um, if you want to look at their composition, there are several spectrometers that have uh, orbited Mars or are currently orbiting Mars, um, the highest resolution of which is called CRISM, the Compact Reconnaissance Imaging Spectrometer for Mars, which has a resolution nominally 